Good morning, my friends. This is Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study. And I'm so glad that you are here today. Let's take our Bibles and begin in the book of Hebrews chapter 6. And today we're going to talk about methods of destiny acceleration. I've been having a fun time with these over the last few months, and they've they have proven very effectual, and I want to share these methods with you in today's message. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would breathe life upon it. Let revelation flow. Let answers and solutions that your people need, let those solutions come to them even while they're engaged in this Bible study. Now, Father, we thank you. We give you all of the praise in Jesus' name we pray, and let's all say amen. Praise God. Again, we are in Hebrews chapter 6. I want to jump down to verse 12, and I'm glad that you're hungry for the things of God and that you take your calling and your assignment serious, and God's going to see to it that you get it all accomplished. Praise God. Now, verse 12, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we are to uh, uh, imitate, we are to look at the example of others who've gone before us, and we are to walk with faith and patience and fulfill and accomplish what we're called to do just like they did. And so we are called to take our inheritance, do the things that God has called us to do, and also there's the internal inheritance, which is to develop into and become the person that God has called us to be, which is a reflection of the mature image of Christ Jesus in us. So what does verse 12 mean? It means that we are to observe those who have gone before us, and we are to locate their footsteps, and in a similar way, put our feet in those same steps. Why? Because they accomplished their assignment, they fulfilled their high calling, and God wants us to do the same type of imitation so we can get the same good results. In other words, link up with them in areas that are relevant to your course and your purpose in life. Their overall assignment could have been uh, in some ways very different from yours, but you can still see uh, connections that you can make, gleanings that you can uh, examine their life and say, you know what? They really excelled in that area, and I'm called to the same thing, so let me put my feet in their steps and walk it out. So I would call one of the first methods of destiny acceleration. I would call it observation. And observation is basically connecting yourself to the steps of great people who've gone before you so that you can fulfill your own unique destiny. But you connect with others who have already accomplished theirs. You do it through observation, praise God. You know, I had a minister that took me under his wing and he would go do meetings, and I could watch him minister. I could also watch him while he pastored his church, and I could stand there and firsthand, with eyes open, watch genuine, valid miracles take place. And what happens is that while there is always a great necessity for teaching, when it comes to activating the gifts of the Spirit, some of that is true, what the old-timers say, which is it's better caught than taught. So if you're just taught, but you never see it, uh, you're, you're trying to bridge that gap. But when you're taught, plus you get around it and it's actually happening, then you can catch it. And if you observe carefully, you can move into a similar anointing when God's got that same type of flow pattern for your life as well. I remember being raised up by Dr. Gary Greenwald in prophetic ministry and, you know, it's, it's the traditional uh, equip, train, and activate, and then eventually you've got to go out and do, do your thing. You just can't uh, be a pew warmer for the rest of your life when you have a ministry calling. And so I remember seeing Dr. Gary one day, and he said, well, uh, he said, Stephen, how's your ministry going? 
I said, good. I said, I'm leaving for Africa in two weeks. He said, what? He said, you're, you're going to Africa? I said, yes, there's a meeting. We've got uh, not, you know crusade lined up and uh, I've booked the whole thing out for three weeks, meeting after meeting. He said, you, you did that? How did you do that? I said, well, it just kind of came together. I prayed and asked God and an invitation came and it, we got it all uh, organized and all the money came in for the tickets and all the money came in for the budget. And he was just like, wow. And why was he so surprised? Because... So many others that he would pour into, he would pour into them and they would see how to do it. But they would actually, they would, when it came to actually going out and doing it, uh, fear would hit them and they did not understand you have to walk by faith. And so, you know, we walked by faith and one meeting led to another meeting. One international door opened up another international door. And before you know it, uh, the thing really begins to come into the fullness of what God has. But others, uh, they they love getting prayed over. They loved having hands laid on them. And they loved especially getting prophesied over. But then two years go by, nothing's changed. Five years go by, nothing has changed. And eventually, you have to get out of the nest and you got to spread your wings and you have to fly so you can observe. Now, there's there's more than just observation, but observation is a very, very big part of it. You know, I watched my friend Sid Roth for many years. And of course, I think my first program that I did with him, he invited me on his show. I can't remember, but I, I think maybe it was like uh, 2009 or something like that. But today... Sometimes when people see Sid's show and his ministry, and they maybe see it for the first time, and they see, you know, this this gigantic ministry, uh, you know, and they have their own beautiful facility and everything. But, you know, when I was first invited, Sid was still leasing, and he would have to lease from a production house. And that meant that every time he's done, they take the whole set apart and put it over in another room, and then they pop up the next set for whoever's recording next. Maybe in a lot of times, uh, that would be a NASCAR uh, drivers and uh, NASCAR talk shows and stuff like that. And then a few months later, when he's ready to come back, they pull the set back out and reassemble it and do all of that. Uh, but today, he's got his own beautiful place. He has a dedicated hard set, and it's great to see that. But see, I could observe all of that. And I could watch and see that one day I'm going to have my own facility and we're going to be able to record our own programs. But I also realized it didn't happen for Sid overnight. And uh, the journey in, uh, towards fulfillment of prophecy is a journey of faith and patience. But while you're on that journey, observe and you can glean things and you can you can think, I'm going to incorporate that into what God's called me to do, whether it's ministry or business or in whatever career field you have. You can say, I'll take that because that works so good. Woo, praise God. <laughs> Amen. So I would say that one of the great methods of accelerating your destiny is really observation. And if you've never been around big things, you, you need to do that. Let's say you're, you're in ministry, but all you know is local ministry. Maybe you pastor a local church and it's in a small community. And so we have a church of 25 people. One of the greatest things that you could do is take vacations where you get out of town and you go to large uh, whether it's a uh, you know Christian uh, type meetings or or you you you've got to have exposure. Praise the Lord. Now, my pastor today, who's who's much older than me, you know his ministry has reached around the world. Uh, you know I've talked with him when his t and you know he told me one time his TV budget was a million dollars a week. <laughs> He's paying that every single week. But, you know, observation allows you to see how others who have gone, who've already gone before you and they're older and they've learned some things. And, you know, I'm still in my 50s, but if I talk to people that are in their 70s and onwards and they have already uh, experienced some certain things, I'm going to glean wisdom. And I can also observe what they've built and I can talk with them and ask them questions and also even mistakes they made. Wow. I, I'll i never forget one of my spiritual mentors. He's in heaven now. 
and he, he told me some amazing things about ministry that even some things I'm not in yet, but later in life, I know that I will be. I've already got, uh, how could I say, wisdom secrets sitting on the shelf that I can apply when that time comes. Oh, praise God. Amen. So you'll learn in life as you observe what's good and what you can implement in your life, and also you can learn by their mistakes uh, what not to do. And you may even see some golden examples of how not to do it. And God allows you to pick up on that and take that wisdom with you on your destiny journey. But observation is a great accelerator. You know, if you've only been like in meetings with 100 or maybe 200 people, uh, and you've never experienced uh, like stadium crusades where there's, you know, maybe 100,000 people in the meeting or something like that. Uh, You need that type of exposure. Now, there is another ministry local, uh, very close to mine uh, as far as location, and their annual budget is right at a billion dollars. Not a million, but a billion dollars every year. And so that's global. So when you have a ministry on that level, you are actually operating with a budget and with a team that is larger than what even some nations have. So yes, you can make uh, major impact and you can do a lot for reaching around the world with the gospel and winning souls for Jesus. But I tell you what, you need to see things like that. If you're in business, you need to... um, You need to see larger businesses than where you're at right now, and you can still learn from their footsteps what they did, and those things will move you further. So observation, where you go, and you can actually touch it, and you can actually see it, and you can say, wow, they did it. I can do it too, but here's the catch. You can do it with your own spin, with your own flavor, with your own Uh, the way that you like to paint and color your world, yes. And you'll have your turn. You'll have your time, which is why it's so important because no vision is ever fulfilled overnight. Even if you had a billion dollars given to you today, you still can't just go out tomorrow and somehow fulfill the vision. No, it takes time. You've got to get quotes. You've got to talk to maybe contractors. You've got to, you still have to take your time. Nothing is going to get walked out overnight. You have to just stay with the journey and build it out the right way, lest you rush and make mistakes. Praise God. So what will happen is that while you observe, the more you observe, what will happen is that it will lead you over into another area, which is uh, another method of destiny acceleration, which is that you'll come into a place of reasoning. And this is something I want to work through slowly today because it's what spirit-filled people particularly uh, want to skip over, but it is so, so beneficial, and I would even say essential, and I'm talking about reasoning. Let me give you an example with reasoning. Um, I observed when I was doing recordings with Sid Roth that those those messages would go around the world, those interviews, and there would be like a flood, a huge flood of like uh, emails and, uh, you know, nonstop phone calls, and then eventually that would kind of recede, and, you know, you're back to your still busy schedule, but you're not like overwhelmed. But there was an observation that I began to see and that that I began to reason on. Which is better, to go on as a guest for one week and it goes all over the world, which is better, to do that or to have your own television show and you can begin to go on the same networks and then instead of just just being something that's like a once, like uh, like a, a high wave, what if you just keep pushing the gospel out every single week what was that? That was something that came to me through reasoning, because uh, no matter how high a mark might be, and we thank God for those special doors, you know, you also, in your own timing, I mean, in your own way, you can break through and you can do it also. You can begin to walk in the same steps. And, uh, you know, I've talked with Sid, hey, what are good networks? What are networks that you went on that really didn't produce hardly anything? And he would be honest and he would tell me. (laughs) You know, it's not a lot of fun if you're paying $13,000 for uh, 
a 30 minute show and you don't even get one email response. You don't even get one phone call. Nobody even ordered one product. That's not a lot of fun, especially if you're on that network five times a week. Hey, that can add up real quick, right? So even if you have a lot of money, uh, you don't have money like that to throw away. And, and technically, we don't ever throw away money. We want to be good stewards w- with what we have. But you also want there to be productivity. So there's reasoning. And I began to reason, Lord, hey, this is great that I go to this country and record all of these programs for this person's network or that I'm a guest on this person's show and that's their show. But Lord, I would like to have mine. And you know, after doing literally hundreds of shows for others, God actually gave me the name for my TV show. And today that that uh, show is aired literally in over 200 nations of the world. We broadcast out of Bethlehem, Israel, all over the Middle East, all over Israel. And we're on several networks that reach into over 200 nations and It's just really neat what God has done, and he's not done yet as we're continuing to expand. But I would like to talk about reasoning for a moment because we as humans made in the image of God, we are very, very different from animals. There uh, in North Carolina, along our coast, we have a small island chain off the coast that's called the Outer Banks. And if you ever go to the Outer Banks, one of the islands is called Mustang Island because back in the 1500s, there were a couple of Spanish galleons that got caught in a hurricane and they sunk. And so the men and the horses that were on the ship uh, swam to the island. Well, about two months later, the men got picked up and they left, went back home, but they left the horses on the island. It's been about 500 years and the horses are still there. But here's the difference with with a man and a horse. If the men had decided to stay on the island, the first thing they would begin to think is, you know what? We're getting rained on all the time. Let's build some coverage so we're not wet all the time. And second, uh, it's kind of cold at night. Let's start a fire. And then third, let's build a more permanent structure since we're, we're going to be here for a while. And then fourth, hey, let's plant some uh, some food so that we don't starve. Let's plant you know wheat or corn or whatever it might be. But you know what? The horses are still there, still standing out in the rain when it rains, standing out in the cold when it's cold. Why? They're animals. They don't have the ability to do what? To reason like you and I do. I mean, you can go to the remote uh, jungle of Uganda and go back and see the mountain gorilla. And that gorilla uh, and all the gorillas before him, they've been out in that jungle. And when it rains, they're still sitting underneath the tree trying to get out of the rain. And not one gorilla has ever said, you know what? We've got hands and fingers just like these humans do. Let's build us a house and let's set up a sewer system and and let's uh, start planting some crops so we can eat some better food instead of just bananas. But they don't do that. Do they? Why? They cannot reason the way that we can. Mm -mm. Praise God. So look at this amazing story in Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, verse 28, Jesus said, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Enough money, of course, and enough supplies. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Shocking, wildly shocking how many Christians still do this today. They start something and they never finish it. And from the beginning, they never thought the process through. Why? They didn't reason. Maybe they prayed about it and maybe it was of God but they did not reason the whole thing through and it was never completed. And it says here, uh, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, it doesn't really work like that. If a person starts and doesn't finish, then people are kind and sweet and they're understanding and they say things like, well, we hope it works out better next time. Oh, no, it doesn't. They actually do uh, laugh. They do mock. They'll even send maybe journalists out to say, hey, how come you couldn't finish this? 
I mean, uh, Kelly and I, we know a minister personally who started a building, very grandiose idea. I mean, megalith, uh, like megalithic type idea. He was going to build a giant structure. And it's big. It's big, all right. The only problem is that he's never finished it. And it has been now over 22 years since he started, and he still has not finished it. And there are reporters and journalists. They'll come with their uh, video cameras, and they'll come to his office, and they'll say, when are you going to finish this thing? And every year, he'll say, we hope to have it done by next year. And they'll say, well, you said that last year. Well, you know, we trust to get it done. And you know what? They laugh, and the people mock, and people in the community laugh and mock him because he started something that he was not able to finish. Now, at the beginning, he thought he would be able to. Something happened uh, in the in that local area econo- uh, economically that caused a shift that he never foresaw. Uh, but if he would have thought it through, hey, what happens if that ever dries up? I, I, I couldn't finish. Well, he overlooked that, started anyhow, and he's never finished. The only problem now is that he's getting pretty old and running out of time real quick and may never finish. So what Jesus said is very, very true. My friends, you don't want to overdo it. At the same time, you don't want to underdo it and let's say build something too small and then you've outgrown it within just a couple of weeks or something like that. But you want to get it right. You want to get it, uh, you want to get in that sweet spot and you really need the help of the Holy Spirit to do that, where you sit down and you begin to reason, and you allow the Holy Spirit to work with your mind so that you can sync up with the perfect will and plan of God. You know, it's possible to labor. I'm talking about laboring very hard, but still not achieve satisfactory results. And that can be a Uh, nothing short of aggravating, (laughs) praise God. But a person may know what to do, but not know how to do it. Have you ever seen somebody in one of those categories? Uh, I see it uh, in the area of health, where where people think, I need to get in shape. I need to get get, uh, in better health. How about this? I need to lose weight. And so maybe they go to the gym and they do all of this stuff and they push this and they they push that around and they get on the treadmill and do this and that. And they do it for a, like maybe like a couple of months. And oftentimes they're hardly getting any type of results. Uh, now, it, it's good to have movement, but it takes more than just movement. You actually have to know what you're doing or not much is going to change. And I've had people say, I can't lose weight. I've tried and they just like give up on it. What's going on? There's something they don't know. They've never sat down and reasoned that in their effort to build a tower, or we could say an effort to get their body in order, they've never sat down and thought about, I wonder if my nutrition has anything to do with this. Because you can walk on the treadmill, but if you're living on carbs and uh, you're just eating carbohydrates all the time, uh, it's, you're going to have a lot of challenges. Wow. Now, if you're a marathon runner and you're in training for a marathon, well, enjoy. Eat all the carbs you want. Eat all the spaghetti. Eat all the pizza. <laughs> eat all the bread. You, you could, and you can get away with it. But if you're a normal person, you're working like a nine or nine to five or an eight to five job, and you're sitting a lot and you're you're living on carbs. Wow. I mean, just walk walking to walking a couple miles on a treadmill or moving around a little bit, it's, it's not going to do anything hardly. So there's other variables. There's uh, in the area of health. I've seen also people overtrain, and uh, then they're not getting the results. And I'm like, well, you're not getting any rest. <laughs> you, you, you did a major workout yesterday, and you're back in the gym again, and you're, you're trying to push through it. And, it, and so again, that, that usually... Uh, leads to injury. And so all of these things, you want to get it right. Sit down and observe what others are doing, how they're doing it. Hey, what are you eating? What are you not eating? Ask questions and begin to get things unraveled, okay, as far as the knowledge base. But it works the same also in business and 
ministry. You know, I uh, th- this is kind of crazy. Years back, I had a church in Orange County, California, and so I had a pastor call me one day, and um, he said, hey, uh, uh, he said, uh, Pastor Brooks, he said, we have a problem. I said, who has a problem? He said, you and I. I said, I don't have a problem. He goes, well, w- we've got a problem here. I said, well, w- what's the problem? He said, you have the name of my church. You've taken the name of my church. I said, uh, no, I haven't taken your church's name. He said, he said, yes, you are. He said, you're calling your church the same name that I'm calling my church. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, when I went down to the, um, to the office of the county clerk here in the county and filed for the fictitious business name of this church and then legally filed the paperwork for this name so I can use this name in the county, I said, there was no other church with this name. And he got real quiet. Why? He had never done that. He was actually using a name. He had never filed it. He had no, uh, he had, he didn't even, he didn't have a nonprofit organization set up for it or anything like that. He's just kind of like out there flying along with this name. And the church did have a couple hundred members, but uh, no, he, he wasn't doing it right. So I said, I don't have to change anything. I said, I'm legal. I said, you're the one that needs to change because you're not legal. <laughs> Those are the kind of pastors when the offering comes in, they just reach their hand in the offering and they take what they want. Nobody is on salary. There's no accounting of the money. He's the pastor and the accountant and uh, no, nothing's run by the books. Everything is, is goofy. And that's also why a, a person that does things like that, you, you'll only have very limited growth. Mm-mm. So what do we need to do? We need to observe, but we also need to sit down and reason. Praise God. Think it through. So it's not just doing something, you know, well, I'm I'm, I'm doing something, but no, we want to do the something the right way. Praise God. It's not just work, but it's also wise work that results in the increases that we are looking for. Take a look at this in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, verse 15. I hope this is helping somebody today. I have a feeling it is, praise God. (laughs) It says, the labor of fools wearies them. Notice that uh, the fool is actually laboring, but he's still, he's got the major problem. He's got all the foolishness in him. So the labor of fools wearies them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. So the wisdom element is often the missing link that causes people to work and work with little or nothing to show for it. And you know, you do that for a while. After a while, you can get real discouraged because you're not observing and you're not reasoning. But as you sit down to reason, this is wild. As you sit down to reason, you actually stir up the treasures that God has put on the inside of you. And trust me, it's it's in there, but you pull it up when you begin to reason and get quiet. Mm -mm. Praise God. Glory to the Lord. Every tower is a product of great thought. I'm talking about a completed tower. (laughs) Now, here's something I want you to consider. This is what I got this morning. The depth of your thoughts determines the height of your accomplishment. Well, that's not true, Pastor Stephen. That's like a nice, maybe philosophical statement. It's not really true. Oh, it is. I can prove it. Now, let me say it again, then I'm going to prove it to you. The depth of your thoughts determines the height of your accomplishment. And here's how I know that's true, because I'm going to say it a different way. The depth of your thoughts determines the height of your tower. It has to. You cannot have a height of a tower built when you don't even know how high you're going to go. Well, I'm going to build a tower. How many stories high? Um, I don't know. I'm just going to keep going higher and I'll build it as I go. No, you can't do it like that. So before you ever build it, you have to know how high it's going to be. Well, I'm going to build it. Pastor Stephen, I'm, I'm just going to put stairs in it to save money. 
What's the square footage of your tower? Oh, it's this much. Oh, you can't use stairs. Why? Building codes require that if you go over that square footage, you have to have an elevator. I don't want that. That's going to be an extra $400,000. Well, that means you can only build it two stories tall. Not much of a tower, is it? <laughs> Come see my tower. Two stories high. <laughs> Woo, praise God. So every tower is a product of great thought or great thinking. The depth of your thoughts determines the height of your accomplishment. The depth of your thoughts determines literally how tall your tower is going to be. So if, you, if you're not thinking much, you're going to have a little, little bitty tower. Maybe, maybe by the time it's built, we shouldn't even call it a tower. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Now, if it's uh, 10 feet tall, not 10 feet, but 10 stories tall, and you've broken 100 feet, and you built it right, and it's reinforced, and it's going down in the concrete, steel pillars, things like that. Okay, praise God, you did a good job. But that was a lot of thinking that went into that so that the wind doesn't blow it over, or if there's ever an earthquake, the thing starts coming down. Praise God. So you want to engage your mind with reasoning in order to further your ministry or to expand your business or to accomplish the next phase of what your vision is. Woo! Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. All right. So we observe and we reason, and then it's time for meditation. Mm -mm. This one's really fun. You're going to like this one. Meditation. Let's go over the first Timothy chapter four and drop down to verse, oh, let's go to verse 13. Paul the apostle said, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Verse 15, are you ready? Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So progress, which is something that we would all desire, progress is the fruit of meditation. Pastor Stephen, I'm very serious about fulfilling my calling. Good. Do you do any meditation? Oh, I'm not really into that. And by the way, Pastor Stephen, that's dangerous. That's Eastern mysticism. Uh, no, we're not talking about the Eastern form of meditation, which is to empty yourself so that a demon can come in. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about biblical meditation. And what is that, by the way? What is meditation? It is concentrated mental attention. Mm. Not on a video game. Not on endless scrolling through Instagram. No, but on the problem you need to solve. Mm. Meditation is concentrated mental attention concentrated mental attention. Mm -mm. Now, the more mental attention you give to any scripture, the more insight you have on it. So we're not talking like so much expansion as we're talking depth. Mm. We're not talking quantity, although that's good. We're now moving into the area of quality, quality over quantity. So the more mental attention you give to any scripture, the more insight you have into that scripture. Meditation is the easiest way, the easiest way to digest scriptures. What you read is not profitable until it is digested. Just like what you eat is not profitable to you until it undergoes a digestive process. Now, I'm going to say a few things that might challenge a few that are maybe kind of like religious, but, but hang with me for a minute as I take you through this process of thinking and as I share why I hold to this line of thinking. Let me say that mental digestion requ requires the process of meditation. Praise the Lord. Mental digestion requires the process of meditation. It, we're, we're talking about practical application. Meditation means sitting on an issue mentally until you are able to see through 
to a solution. Now, I want to slow that down, and I want you to get this into your spirit. Meditation means sitting on an issue mentally until you are able to see through to a solution. Now, you meditate on scriptures, but you meditate also on the issues you're facing in life. Yes, Pastor Stephen, we meditate on God's Word. Yes, but you can use the meditation of the Word also to begin to unlock the challenging problems that you would have in life. So you meditate on scriptures, but you also meditate on the issues you are facing in life as well. Mm -mm. And you sit on that issue mentally until light is shed on it. Woo, praise God. Praise God. Now, when I was praying about this, I felt that some of you that maybe you feel stuck and maybe an area of your destiny. Maybe you feel stuck because somebody shared information with you that was wrong. Now, maybe they were not trying to, uh, like, give subterfuge to your purpose and calling. They're not trying to sink your boat. Maybe they just shared something with you that is wrong, and they don't know it's wrong. Maybe they're just repeating what they know, and what they know is not accurate. And... And so you're still thinking that you're stuck when in reality, there is a way forward. Now, you may have to get another quote. Well, there is no lower quote. It can't be done for less than that, uh, according to what they say, because they want your business. But somebody else might be able to do it for a whole lot less. But you'll never know unless you get another quote. And also after that one, get another quote after that one too. Mm -mm. Maybe you need to get another quote. Maybe, listen, maybe you need to get another opinion. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, that person who told me, though, is my most trusted brother-in-law. Well, let's get it. Let's get some information from outside of the family. Mm. Let's get somebody else's opinion in this, who's a specialist in the area or who has knowledge in this specific field. Praise God. Mm -mm. So, there is always, always a way out of every problem. There's always a way out. It doesn't matter if the problem is a mechanical problem or if the problem is a problem with your body and the doctor has said there's no cure. And maybe from his opinion and his perspective, there isn't. But let's get a higher opinion. And you can certainly get that from the Word of God, which is the highest wisdom of all. Mm -mm. So there is a way out. There's always a way out. So there can be progress. You maybe think you're stuck, but as you observe and as you reason, and then, then as you also begin to really meditate, I'm talking going deep on this, you realize there's a way out. Look at this in Isaiah chapter one, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together. Now, why would God give that presentation? Because they're stuck in a mess. They're stuck in a place of apostasy. They've gone away from God. And when you get away from God, you become a legal target for the devil and he'll hit you. He, that, that's just his job. It's coming <laughs> one way or another. It's coming. So what is God saying? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. In other words, let's sit down and reason and think this thing through. Sin has caused this mess in your life. Yes, Pastor Stephen, I can see that, but I really need that. No, you don't need that. That's part of the lie. You don't need anything to do with sin. Hmm. Now, what should we do? This is what God is saying that you should do when you really start thinking about it. You start right where you're at doing the right thing. If you're willing and obedient, okay? So you have to be willing to walk away from the sin and the slop 
okay, and what it, walk away from the awful things that it's doing to your life and then say, I'm willing to leave it. Now I want to be obedient. I want to start serving God. And all it takes is the first step. And you can walk out of any problem and walk into a free flow uh, uh, with the Holy Spirit Will things begin to work the way they are supposed to in life. Woo, praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Glory to God. We start by doing the right thing. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -mm. You know, reading is good. Reading the Bible is good. But reading provides access to information. But meditation provides access to illumination. I want to say that again. Reading provides access to information, and that information could be good, but meditation provides access to illumination. And so it's just like the Ethiopian eunuch reading from the book of Isaiah, reading, reading, he's getting information, but has absolute no light on the subject. And so you might as well, you, you might as well be, be reading something else. Why? You don't understand it. And you, until there's illumination, it's not going to do you any good. Praise God. Look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to present yourself approved to God. Study or be diligent to dig deep, okay? Not just skim through the surface and you know some things, but you have no way to apply them. And worst of all, maybe you don't even really know what the, it, it is talking about. Study to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Praise the Lord. Praise God. You know, sometimes I have people that tell me things like, Pastor Stephen, last week I read the entire New Testament. I just sat down and read the whole thing. And I'm like, well, that's good. Here, here, here. I happen to have a nickel on my table. Here's a nickel. <laughs> Enjoy. Here, I'll give you a nickel for your great effort. <laughs> and that is nice. I remember one time I sat down and I read the whole book of Jeremiah. It took maybe like, oh, almost three hours. I felt, I felt good. I read the whole book of Jeremiah. Maybe I should have given myself a nickel. <laughs> because after I read it, I stood up and went about my life and didn't solve one problem in it. And while we uh, want to read the Word, what's much, much more valuable is to meditate on it, where you can actually take something out of it that produces, you know, a portion of the inheritance that God says belongs to you. Mm -mm. So we're going deeper. Sometimes I have people that say, Pastor Stephen, I listened to your teaching. I've tried it. It's not working. Okay. Or I read your book and, you know, I didn't really, it's just not working for me. Well, okay, let's do this. Show me the book that you read. Well, it's right over here, Pastor Stephen. After all, you know what you wrote it. Yes. Show me the book. Hand me the book. You look at the book. There's not one note taken in the whole book. There's not one highlighter mark in the entire book. Are you sure you read it? Oh yeah, I, I read it. I just sat down and read the whole thing through. You read it? Are you, oh, did you, did you read it or did you study it? Well, I read it. Obviously there's not a note in the whole book. You know, I know a, a very famous musician. He died. When he died young, uh, his wife gave me his Bible because he, he really loved me. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, quote, a famous person, unquote. Uh, so his wife wanted to give the Bible to somebody that would, you know, it meant, you know, it meant something. So she gave me his Bible. I, I took his Bible and opened it up. You know, this is after, you know, he's passed away and all looked at it. Not one note, not, not one pen mark in the whole Bible, not one highlighter. Anywhere from Genesis to Revelation, nothing underlined, nothing, uh, nothing, nothing like that would show any indication of study, meditation, 
Uh, and that's why he was taken out. There was things he didn't know, and the enemy caught him in a certain area and took him out, and he's off the planet. And really, the great assignment that he had for his life, he was building, building closer to it, and now it's all it's gone. It's all gone. Will probably never be accomplished because he's not here, and uh, it's probably never going to go anywhere. But my friends, you have to uh, meditate and begin to dig deep. Praise God. So, so if all you do is stay on the surface, you're not going to get it into your spirit. Well, Pastor Stephen, I read I read that, and uh, I'm not. It's just not working. Show me your Bible. Show me your Bible. It's like it's like um, it's like your checkbook. Your checkbook tells you where your heart is at. Uh, whether you're giving to God and you have His, ki- you know, you have His kingdom interest on your heart. Uh, same with your Bible, uh, a clean Bible, uh, and you've had it for ten years. Something's something's wrong. <laughs> you should be wearing them out. I'm not. I'm not saying you take it and you throw it down or stuff like that, or you do some kind of dishonorable or unholy act like the um, pastor, like on social media sometime back during the Super Bowl. They took a Bible and they kicked it like it was a football. Uh, that, that's probably the greatest workout that Bible ever had is when the person kicked it with their foot. There's probably no notes in it at all, no, nothing studied or anything. <laughs> Praise God. But my friends, God wants you to begin to reason and think. Think on the Word and think on those challenging areas of your life, and the Holy Spirit will show you a way out. And not only that, you've got a God that does miracles, And as you begin to apply what you can do in the natural, God will come along and put his super upon it. And the next thing you know, you're free. The next thing you know, you're out. And the next thing you realize is, wow, God's right. I don't need that anyhow. I don't need that crutch. I don't need that handicap. I don't need that that addictive habit. I don't need that. Pastor Stephen, I can't live without cigarettes. That's what the enemy would suggest to you. And maybe you've built up a stronghold in your mind, a, a way of thinking that I can't, I can't survive without this. I'm telling you today, there is a way out and you can thrive without it. Woo, praise God. Mm-mm. Praise the Lord. You know, for those that love to read the word, which is important, which is good because you're going to get information. But for those that never really go deep, uh, you're going to run into some problems in life that you can't solve unless you've really got it into your heart. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, Psalm 119. Here is a very misunderstood scripture. Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Yes, Pastor Stephen, I'm real big on scripture memorization. I'm not. Not at all. Why? Because I've met countless people who can quote scripture, just like a machine gun. Just quote scriptures faster, and they're spitting out scriptures. And they don't even know what the scriptures really mean. And they'll misquote scripture. Why? They've memorized it, but they've memorized it out of context. They don't even know what it means. When I grew up in church as a young boy... We would have scripture memorization contest, and some of the young kids could really quote the scriptures. But then I would see the same young people in school because we, you know, we go to the same school, and boy, could they ever curse and use profanity or tell dirty jokes like you wouldn't believe. But in church, they could they could win scripture quoting competitions. Well, Pastor Stephen, though that doesn't make sense. The Bible says, "Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you." Where, where are we missing it at? Here's where people miss it at. They hide the word in their head, not in their heart. I'd rather have two scriptures in my heart that can work, and I can work them. And I, it's like a sword that I can use. I'd rather have two of them than 200 scriptures in my head, and it's all in my head. None of it's in my heart. It's all in my head, and it's useless. It's, it's, it really is useless, and that might hurt somebody's feelings, but that's just the truth. And really, in life, in your walk with the Lord, you're you're looking for what works. You're looking for what produces victory. 
And if it's not, you should sit down and figure out why is this not working? And for many, uh, the scriptural memorization, it doesn't work. You have a bunch of stuff in your head, but it's not in your heart. Your word I have hidden in my heart, not my head. So you hide God's word in your heart. The ones you put in your heart are the ones that God speaks to you by the Holy Spirit. They're illuminated. It has life to you. You know, if I'm reading something in the Bible and I feel like I might as well be reading like a some kind of a nursery rhyme or something like that. I stop I stop reading when I'm reading and I go somewhere else. I go where I'm being fed. I go where the Holy Spirit is highlighting what's feeding me. <laughs> I'm not just trying to be in a, a walking encyclopedia of the Bible, which is why you have those talk show hosts in the Christian community that they, they uh, identify themselves as being the Bible answer man. In other words, they've got an answer for everything that you have a question about in the Bible. And they're deceived in the thinking they actually know everything because nobody does except for God. But they think they do. And that's because they have a lot of stuff in their head. So, but the focus should never be on on that. It should be on the illumination of what is in your heart. So you have to reason and you have to think. And as you do, you'll begin, you'll begin to get the word into your heart and you'll also get answers that'll come up from out of your spirit that register with your mind on what you're supposed to do. Of who you could go talk to next to move forward with your plan or what the next step should be, or, you know, what type of work you should apply next. Woo. Praise God. Mm -mm. You know, God has not planned for any of his people to have a failure type life. Now I know that some people do embrace that theology that God has called some to be rich and God has called some to be poor. And then God has called some to be in the middle or whatever it might be. I, I don't believe that at all. And the reason I don't believe that is because I don't see that in Scripture. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So your destiny or your calling is glorification, not uh, a car wreck. It's glory of glorification, not to be a victim. It's glorification. It's where God's uh, will is revealed through you, and you're walking in that, and people can see you as an ambassador of the kingdom of God, not as somebody that looks like they just got ran over by a steamroller. No. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So what you have to do, my friends, is observe. As you observe, you begin to realize, hey, that which is also pertaining to my calling, I can do that too. I can do that too. You put your feet in their steps. And then you reason. You reason things through. You sit down and you think about the tower that you're going to build, the business that you're going to build, who your customer base will be. Who is this product most useful for? Does anybody even want this product before we fabricate it and begin to put it, you know, uh, and buy, buy equipment to make it. Does, does anybody even want this? Okay. So you do all of that through reasoning and then you do meditation and you begin to go deeper with meditation. Mm. It's that concentrated mental focus. Woo. Praise God. Mm. And answers begin to come forth. You know, there's always a way to expand every year when, uh, major corporations have their shareholder, annual shareholder meeting. The CEO and uh, leaders of the company will come on and say, this is what we're planning to do to expand, not shrink and not sink the business. This is what we're planning on doing this year to create greater growth and to uh, have larger profit margins. Nobody ever comes on there and says, this is what we're planning on doing this year to make less money because there's a difficult economy. No, there's always a way forward, but you have to think. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, 
He will show you what to do next. Now, no excuses. No excuses for why there's failure. Well, Pastor Stephen, there, you know, all of this happened. No, we can move forward. God is with you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. This is the hour for the church, that's you, to shine. Mm -mm. God's taking you to the top. And I want to encourage you to implement these methods of dynamic, destiny, forward motion. I'll tell you, I'm telling you, they'll work for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are watching, but listening and taking this to heart. I thank you, Father, that you're going to show them what to do. And they're going to do it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Bless your people. Amen. Somebody's thinking, well, Pastor Stephen, uh, God's not really talking to me. Well, is there is there like continual sin in your life. I remember when I was young and I had a season in my life where God didn't really talk to me, but the moment I determined I'm shutting this thing off and uh, I'm coming back to the Lord, instantly God started talking. <laughs> well, Pastor Stephen, God has abandoned me. God's, God's not with me. Well, he's there, but he's not going to jump into that stuff with you. He'll pull you out of it and whenever you're ready to come out, whenever you're ready to serve the Lord, God's right there for you, ready to embrace you, ready to take off the dirty garments, and ready to put on a clean robe of righteousness on you. Praise God. But I'll tell you, there's nothing that will goop up or gum up the hearing ear more than just messing around in sin and doing things that you know that are wrong. You need to make a clean break. Praise God and get on that high definition signal of hearing from God. Praise the Lord. Glory. Come now, let us reason together. That's what the Lord said. Though your sins be like this, you got a real mess. He says, I can wash you whiter than snow. So if you're listening and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, it's time for you to get your life right with God today. Amen. Now, also, there's another group. Maybe that you used to serve the Lord, but you backslid and you've become like the prodigal and you've ended up in the pig pen. Did you ever stop to consider that in the Holy the Gospels, when it says, it says that the prodigal son came to his senses, he came to his senses. What does that mean? It means he reasoned out what was going on. He said, man, I'm sitting here, uh, eating uh, food that the pigs are eating, and I'm having to work this awful job. My life is a total wreck and a disaster. Yet back at my father's house where I used to be, everything was perfect. It was a great life. And he began to reason his way out of the pig pen. Anybody can do that. Anybody can. <laughs> you could have a drug addiction problem. You could have a demon problem, but you can still, in the midst of all of that mess, say, you know what? This is not where I want to be, and I'm coming out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not staying here. I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, I am making a deliberate decision. God, help me get out of this mess, and he'll do it. So if that's you, and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, it begins by saying, I want out of the pig pen, and that's what he did. He reasoned with himself and said, I don't like where I'm at. Okay. Praise the Lord. You can do that right now. And the first step you can take is to rededicate your life back to God and walk towards the Lord and walk away from that junk. Praise God. Now, if you fit any of those categories, let's pray. Just pray this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I repent of all of my sin." all of it. Wash me. Jesus, wash me clean with your blood from all sin. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood. Now, Jesus, write my name in your book of life and step into my life today and lead me and guide me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for restoring me. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to God. 
Did you ever notice that God's word is an instruction manual for life? <laughs> well, I don't like it, Pastor Stephen. God said, don't do this, and I like doing that. Well, he's not trying to spoil your fun. He's trying to keep you from going to hell. And he's, kind, he's trying to, he said that because he knows that thing will destroy you. But I'd tell you what, there is such freedom in the Lord. Praise God. Such freedom in the Lord. Now, come on. Your life is right with God now. Begin to run with the Lord. Begin to serve Him and live for Him. And just take it step by step. Start doing the right thing in every area, and life will get better quick. Woo! It'll get better real quick. And the, the Lord will also get the enemy off of you. Praise the Lord. Mm, glory to God. Glory to God. I felt like I've, while well, I've been teaching this, like I've been slogging through mud, almost like I'm walking uphill uh, because I know people have problems. I know even God's people can have great challenges, but you must realize there's a way forward. There's a way out of any problem. Doesn't matter how big it is. Doesn't matter if you're in a pit, God can get you out. Praise the Lord. So just keep walking with him and things will get better every single day. Praise the Lord. Glory. Glory to God. Father, strengthen your people. We give you praise. Father, sometimes we don't want to take the medicine because it's not pleasant. It doesn't maybe taste good, but that medicine is the cure. And I thank you, Father, that your word is the cure. It illuminates what we should do so that healing may come forth. So, Father, we thank you. We give you praise. Thank you for the medicine of your word. Hallelujah. Producing the healing effect. Now, let's continue to obey God's word and let's take Holy Communion. We do take it every time we get together in these online meetings. Uh, the thing about communion is that if you don't take it often, you'll probably not take it at all. You, may, you might end up only taking it, maybe like a church might serve it during Easter or Christmas, and that's it. But Paul the Apostle said, as often as you take it, and so we should do it often. All right, so grab some grape juice, grab some unleavened bread, or grab a cracker, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the juice and the bread. We bless it now, and we set this apart as being holy. We thank you that this is the body and the blood of of Jesus. Father, I thank you that during this month, miracles are breaking forth for your people in the most amazing ways. And they're going to say, how did that happen? How did that happen? They'll, they'll know it's you, but they'll say, how did that happen? Father, it's time for breakthroughs and miracles. Father, we give you praise. Father, as we receive the Lord's body, we thank you, O oh God, that you work with our minds. We claim as we receive the Lord's body that we have the mind of Christ, an anointed mind that even if we don't immediately know what to do, we can always find out what to do through meditation, through reasoning, through observing of what others did. And Father, we just thank you for helping us in this area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's receive the Lord's body. Pastor Stephen, I read a book on divine healing. I read the whole book. I'm still sick. Show me the book you read. Show me the book, and I'm going to look for your notes. I'm going to look to see, did you mark it up, or did you just tear through it and read it real quick, and now you could say you read it. Oh, here's another. You read it. Good. Here's a nickel. <laughs> right? D doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Slow down, digest it, eat it, digest it some more, swallow some more. If, if you cannot, look, that's the problem with vitamins. You ever seen the vitamins that are the size of a pill that a horse could maybe hardly swallow? And they give you these vitamins. These vitamins are good. Eat these, uh, you know, uh, swallow these vitamins. You swallow the vitamins, 
They never get digested. They get passed out through your waste uh, product. Why? Because they, they never got digested. It doesn't do anything except make the vitamin company money. And they know that. My friends, digest, digest. Don't just read. Digest. Get it into your mind. Get it into your heart so that you understand it. And you know why you do what you do. And you also know why you don't do certain things a certain way. Because it doesn't work. (laughs) Praise God. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord's blood as we receive it now. We thank you for mercy. Lord, if we live to be maybe the age of Methuselah, I think a lot of these things we could figure out, but we don't have that option. Uh, Maybe at the most 120, but for the average, maybe 85, maybe 90. So Lord, we need your mercy. We need a lot of help. And we ask that you just extend mercy and grace so that we can catch this on the prophetic fast track because we don't have a hundred years. Thank you, Father God. Let us catch it through times of deep meditation, deep mental review, during times of spiritual digestion. Let us get it into our system. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the Lord's blood. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Woo, glory. Glory to God. Well, we are in the month of March. This is, I really do believe, a month where things are going to begin to start popping for you. I want you to receive that. I'm not just saying that because we're trying to take up extra time. This is a month where things are going to begin to really start popping for you. And at the end of the month, March 31st, which, came, which comes early this year, is Resurrection Easter Sunday morning, the day around the world when Christians celebrate the Lord's mighty resurrection. When he came out of that tomb, resurrected, he is alive forevermore. And on that day, I want to encourage you to sow your very best seed into the ministry so that we might move forward in the project's that God has placed before us with wide open doors, but we need your help to step through these doors. And I'm asking you to sow on that day your very best seed, that you would reach deep and do something that would touch the heart of God. And you know, we're all at different places, but I believe that during this month, as things are breaking and things are happening, that God will actually give you the seed Maybe some of it you already have. Maybe you have a number that you want to reach, that you want to sow, and you don't have it yet. I believe God will give you that full seed, and you can take that seed, you can sow it, you can give it, and I want you to bring it in on or before March 31st, and that's Sunday. It's a Sunday morning. That's Resurrection Sunday morning, and I'm going to be praying over your seeds that you sow that the thing that you could never do, that you need divine help to do, that God would step in and he would do that thing for you. And I believe he's going to, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I want to put the giving information up on the screen at this time. And I want you to prepare your seed. Don't just rush something in. I want you to ask God what he would have you do. And then be creative. You may have to sit down and reason Lord, what could I do to pull this seed amount together? And you could reason. You could think, and maybe the Holy Spirit would uh, put up on your heart maybe a garage sale, and you could sell some things you're not using anyhow, and you could use that to further the Lord's kingdom. You know, one of the great tragedies I see today is when people prepare their will, and then they die. And all of their wealth goes to people, maybe their family members, but it goes to people that do not serve God. And they don't leave a penny. They don't leave a dollar for God's work. Whereas they should, if they had a kingdom heart, they should in their will state that they want their their wealth, whatever those items are, 
to, and if it's, you know, if it's stuff that needs to be liquidated, then that's fine. But the proceeds, the money should go to further the work of the Lord, not further somebody's amusement to continue to live on the earth who has no interest in God, who'll just waste it and squander it and will not use one dollar for God's work. So my friends, I, I'm just saying, I see things like this happen all the time where we say, I hear people say, well, we don't have the money. We don't have the ability to give. If you sit down in reason, there's all kinds of things. You could sell that. That hasn't been touched in five years. You could sell that and you could take that and you could give it uh, as a sacred offering into the work of the Lord. God's kingdom moves forward. And while the tithe allows the ministry to operate smoothly, it really is true that it is sacrificial giving that causes kingdom projects to get completed. It causes kingdom projects to move forward and get completed. So I'm just asking you, be creative in your giving. You have license to do that. You have freedom uh, to do that, to sit down and think. Husbands and wives, get on the same page, come together. If you're a single individual, uh, get with the Holy Spirit and uh, come into agreement about what God would have you do. And he'll show you the number and he'll help you to, he'll help you to do it. Praise God. Glory to the Lord. Praise God. Look at it as, as a faith challenge so that you can step into a new level. If you want to go into a, a place you've never been before, you have to sow something that you have never sown before. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your people are being creative in their giving ability of how they could reach the offering level they want to do. Father, right now I'm thinking about the one church member one time that sold his car. He had an old used car, wasn't even using it. He sold it. And out of that, somebody bought it and he was able to give a very generous offering. So Father, let your people be creative in their giving. We give you praise. Thank you, Father. Help them in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Let me say this, and this is very, very opposite of the way the world thinks, but let me say this. Every step towards self-sufficiency is a step away from God. Well, Pastor Stephen, we have to have a savings. Uh, I, I know people where their savings is their God. And if, if, it was, if it were decreased by $1, they would probably stay awake all night and be in fear. But every step towards self-sufficiency, well, you don't need God, you don't need God's help, or you don't, you know, it's all, it's all based on a budget, and it's all based on numbers only. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit or using faith to go to a new level. Every step towards self-sufficiency is a step away from God. So I want to get you closer to God. And that is a walk of faith. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. This is challenging for Western society to embrace where everything has to be insured and everything has to be, you know, like uh, all lined up over in this area where really, you know, if you're walking with the Lord, he, he covers you. He takes care of you. It doesn't mean you don't have a savings. But it does mean that if God were to say, I want you to sow the whole thing, that you would do it. Praise God. And God's not doing that because he's trying to deplete you. He's actually trying to, he's, he's going to use that as a seed platform to spring you forward into something that is greater than perhaps what you've even realized. Glory to God. So God's never trying to take something from us. He's trying to get us to a greater dimension of living. Mm -mm. Praise God. And that often requires sacrifice, and it certainly requires trust. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. So God's moving by His Holy Spirit, and I want you to take time to sit down, look at your tower that God's called you to build, look at your uh, projects that you want to complete, and reason and work your way through them. Some of you, not all of you, but there's a few of you, you're trying to bite off more than you can chew. And while there is the faith element of think big and believe God for big things, that, that's all cool. But there's also, you, you have got to balance that with don't go beyond your faith and don't reach beyond 
uh, the border that the Holy Spirit has given you, which is your faith area. Don't go beyond that and hurt yourself because if you tried to do something that God has not called you to do, let's say you want to build a hospital. God's never called you to build a hospital. And you're going to, you're going to go out, you're going to build a hospital. You're, you're probably going to be the first one admitted to it because you're putting yourself under pressures that God has never called you to put yourself under. So stay in that zone, but allow the Holy Spirit to work with you and you can get accomplished all of that. Amen. It's going to be very exciting. Things are popping. God is moving. March is a month of movement. You, it's a movement where you march forward. Praise God. So go with the, whole, the flow of the Holy Spirit and sow something that puts a smile on God's face. And we'll be praying for your seed, your offering when it comes in. You can mail it in. You can bring it in online, however you would like to. If you need some more time, I perfectly understand that. But I would like for you to get it in on or before March 31st. This is your resurrection seed for God's power to be released in your life, in an area of harvest where you need it. Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you for watching. Thank you for praying about your special offering. And you know what? Go build your tower. But before you lay the first stone, make sure you've got it all figured out on paper. Okay. Get, get extra quotes, get the best opinions, and you'll see that it'll end up being very, very beautiful. All right. God bless you. I'll see you back again real soon. Bye-bye.